Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our in-person and online service of morning prayer. We are delighted that you have joined us this morning. My name is Kim Higginson, and I am one of the licensed slave readers here at Trinity Anglican Church in Durham. And it is wonderful that we can once again be together in person. Our last service together was December 19th, just before Christmas. Somehow it seems so long ago. Our morning prayer service is from the Book of Alternative Services today. It's the green one in the, in the pews. Um, we will be keeping our masks on, and we will be singing hymns. Uh, we'll do the first two verses of the three hymns. And in preparation for our service, let's just take a few moments of quiet reflection. Let us be still as we draw near to worship God. Let us listen. God speaks even through the background noise of the world around us. We acknowledge with respect that Bruce County and Gray County situated on the traditional and treaty territory of the Anishinaabek, the people of the three fires known as the Ojibwe, Odawa, and the Potawatomi Nations, and homeland of the Chippewas of Saugeen, the Chippewa, Chippewas of the Nayishimi and the Métis. This territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties. May we all, as treaty people, live with respect on this land and live in peace and friendship with all of its diverse our opening hymn is number 508, I Heard the Voice of Jesus Say. Thanksgiving. 
first reading is a reading from the book of Deuteronomy. When you have come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance to possess, and you possess it and settle in it, you shall take some of the first of all the fruit of the ground which you harvest from the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you shall put it in a basket and go to the place that, your, that the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name. You shall go to the priest who is in office at that time and say to him, Today I declare to the Lord your God that I have come into the land that the Lord swore to our ancestors to give us. When the priest takes the basket from your hand and sets it down before the altar of the Lord your God, you shall make this response before the Lord your God. A wandering Aramean was my ancestor. He went down into Egypt and lived there as an alien, few in number, and there he became a great nation, mighty and populous. When the Egyptians treated us harshly, he stretched arm with a terrifying display of power and with signs and wonders. And he brought us into this place and gave us this land a land flowing with milk and honey. So now I bring the first of the fruit of the ground that you, O Lord, have given me. You shall set it down before the Lord your God and bow down before the Lord your God. Then you, together with the Levites and the alien who reside among you, shall celebrate with all the bounty that the Lord your God has given you and to your house. The word of the Lord. Our song this morning is Psalm number 91, found on page 826. 2nd reading is a reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans. The word is near you, on your lips and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart, and so is justified. And one confesses with the mouth, and so is saved. The scripture says, no one who believes in him will be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is the Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gradual hymn is number 179, Creed of Life and Optimus Reed. <laughs>
led by the spirit of the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate those days, and, they, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me. Praise you, Lord Jesus Christ. Please be seated for the sermon. morning and begin a new liturgical season on the church calendar. Today is the first Sunday of Lent, a period of time that bridges the celebrations of Epiphany and Easter. Lent is a time of introspection, preparation, and prayer. It presents us with the opportunity to examine our hearts and minds and cultivate a deeper relationship with my reflection this morning consists of three principal parts. The first is a brief overview of the history of Lent and some of its traditions. In the second part, we will focus on Luke's gospel and unpack the significance of the three temptations that Jesus faced while in the wilderness. And finally, we will take a journey to a personal wilderness where we will find ourselves tested and challenged. So let me begin by taking or talking about some of the key things we associate, associate with Lent. The word Lent was originally a secular word with no particular religious association. It is from the Anglo-Saxon lengthen, which refers to the lengthening of days and pretty much translates as spring. The church's season of penitence and fasting traditionally occurred in the springtime leading up to Easter. Over the centuries, the word Lent became synonymous with this liturgical season and the 40-day period before Jesus' passion, death, and resurrection. Today, the season is generally viewed as a time of spiritual renewal, a type of spring cleaning for the soul. You will note that the color purple is used to adorn our altar, prayer desk, lectern, and pulpit. Purple is the liturgical color of Lent. It symbolizes penitence and atonement, as well as the royalty of Christ as King of all kings. In ancient times, purple dye was a rare and precious commodity. It was painstakingly produced from the mucus of various species of marine mollusks. It took some 12,000 shellfish to extract 1.5 grams of pure dye, which made about a yard or two of purple cloth. Because of this laborious process, purple cloth was very expensive and was worn only by the wealthy and those of status, namely royalty and the nobility. When Jesus was led down to be scourged, he was clothed in a purple robe and a crown of thorns was placed on his head. Dressing Jesus in a purple robe was a symbolic act on the part of his torturers to mock and disrespect him, as he was alleged to have claimed he was the king of the Jews. During Lent, the color purple has also come to signify inward reflection, one of the things we are called upon to do in preparation for Easter. The color purple reminds us of the need to take inventory of our failings, errors, and wrongdoings, and to repent to be penitent so that we can become closer to Jesus and God the Father. 
Lent observes the 40 days that Jesus fasted and was tempted by Satan in the wilderness. It is not a coincidence that today's gospel reading from, from Luke on this first Sunday of Lent introduces and takes us to that wilderness. It is believed the wilderness mentioned in our Bible reading is the Judean desert located east of Jerusalem near the Dead Sea. It was a dry and arid landscape, largely uninhabitable. It was full of dangers and it was known for its searing heat during the day and extreme cold at night. There was limited vegetation and a scarcity of water. There were wild animals like lions, and leopards, hyenas, and jackals, not to mention deadly insects and poisonous snakes. Jesus' journey into the wilderness consisted of extreme physical as well as intense mental and spiritual challenges. He was challenged physically by the environment and tested both mentally and spiritually by Satan. <coughs> Our gospel reading this morning is first and foremost a story about Jesus, the Son of God. It is also a story about temptation, about potentially making a bad decision to get out of a difficult situation and acting in a way that ultimately leads to separation from God. And yet, at its heart, it is a very human story. It is a story that portrays Jesus just like any one of us, as a vulnerable human being who faced struggles and trials just as we do. The temptations and trials that Jesus endured target the very core of human nature, the impulse to take control and to trust our human abilities above the power of God. Jesus' sojourn in the wilderness comes just after his baptism in the River Jordan, where, when he is publicly acclaimed as the Son of God, and just before he begins his public ministry in Galilee. The story is very dramatic and is filled with personal fortitude and spiritual lessons. Let's take a closer look. The first test that the devil lays before Jesus is for him to prove his power as the Son of God by turning the stones into bread. Luke tells us that Jesus had not eaten in 40 days, and he was, quote, famished. The devil knew that Jesus was extremely vulnerable. He was tempting Jesus to turn away from God. In other words, Jesus was being tempted to take matters into his own hands rather than pray for and wait upon God's providence. This is something I'm sure we can all relate to. Asking God for things that we need and then outlining to God the specifics of how, what, when, and why. It is very human to want to be in control and get quick results. It conjures up the old ancient Greek saying, God help those who help themselves. But Jesus teaches us through the story of his first temptation that this is not our agenda, but God's that is to be obeyed. Confusing our capabilities with God working in our lives can lead to making huge mistakes. After Jesus refuses to yield to Satan in the afternoon, or the first temptation, the devil, a very tenacious guy, gives it another go. Satan shows Jesus all the kingdoms of the world and promises to give him authority over all of them if only Jesus will bow down and worship him. Jesus responds with wisdom and humility. He refuses to commit the sin of idolatry, that is, giving something an importance greater than God. Jesus knew that the source of his power was from God alone, and that only God is worthy of God of glory, praise, and honor. In the third temptation, the devil takes Jesus to a public place 
to the top of the temple in Jerusalem, Satan tells Jesus to jump to prove that God will rescue him. In Jesus' time, the display of wonders and miracles were extremely popular. If Jesus had yielded to Satan's temptation and God intervened to save him, Jesus would have had rock star popularity. But Jesus knew that this would have been the wrong kind of fame. It would have detracted from his public ministry and more significantly from God's plan for him. Perhaps some of us can identify with Jesus' journey in the wilderness. At different times and deep within ourselves, we have all traversed a wilderness or two to remote and secluded places like feeling hopeless, angry, lonely, remorseful, or downhearted. In, in those moments, some of us may feel lost in the backwoods and drowning in the backwaters. Sometimes in those wilderness places, it's hard to hear God's voice or even to feel that God is present. Journeying through a wilderness is not easy. The trails are not clearly marked, and they can be difficult to navigate. They are filled with twists and turns, obstacles, tests, and temptations. People respond to these challenges in different ways. Some give up their faith and say there is no God. Others come away with having built a deeper, and more meaningful relationship with God. It is so much easier to say we believe in God's goodness and providence when things are going well. Being in a spiritual void is a very solitary and desolate kind of wilderness. It is a dark place that feels barren and empty. Shadows of self-doubt and fear lurk around every corner. I find it inspiring to hear that people who have serious health problems or who suffer from a job loss or deal with financial worries or grieve the death of somebody close or who cope with any number of life's other trials and who are prayerful and give thanks, thanks to God, it reveals so much. These are the people who are tested, yet they find the courage to accept their personal wilderness to persevere, and in spite of setbacks and adversity, they do not lose faith. <coughs> the Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness for 40 days where he was tested by Satan. He rose above Satan's temptations and showed us that we, that we can too. It is not easy. It never is. But if we resist Satan and life's temptations, he will flee from us and God will be there to help us. Lent is an invitation. It beckons us to journey into the wilderness and not despair or give in. Lent is a time to put our souls before a mirror and see ourselves as we really are. To not hide from what lies deep within us. During the coming 40 days, let us invite God to join us along our journey. Let him be our guide through our wilderness. The story of Jesus' temptations in the desert teaches us that in those times when we are at our lowest, when we are in the wilderness, we are to place our trust in God. And whatever the wildernesses we traverse, we have the assurance that God will accompany us just, just as God accompanied Jesus in the desert so many years ago. I don't know if anyone among us is feeling like, like they are in the wilderness today, but with God's grace, we will make it through, and we will have gained so much for having made the journey. Often, it is when we are at our most vulnerable that God is most powerful. Today, on this first Sunday of Lent, let our prayer be. Lord Jesus, you have shown us life in the wilderness. You have shown us faith in the desert. Touch us with your courage. Guide us 
with your wisdom. Comfort us with your love. Prepare us for the future. Lead us on our journey. Amen. their decision. 